Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited this April because all month long, we have been highlighting climate change research and climate change solutions. Uh, over 40 hangouts by month's end, all made possible by Environment and Climate Change Canada, who are sponsoring us for our first ever month dedicated to the topic. So a huge thanks to them. Right now, we've got four classes joining us from across North America, so I'll go to them do a bit of a shout-out before I introduce our speaker. We've got Miss Park, 6th through 8th in Fallon, Nevada. Hi, guys. Woo-hoo! Hi! Hi! Oh. Hey. We've got Mr. McCarthy, grade 12s in Mill Bay in BC. Hi, guys. Hi! Hi. We've got Miss Hans's group who figured out their mic, grade 7s in Austin, Texas. Hi, everyone. Hey! And just joining us, I think there's still an announcement. We've got Miss Rampersad Gurhari's group, Grade Sevens in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, so welcome to them as well, and we'll, we'll get to them when we get to Q and A. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live by Christine Chen. She is a geologist from MIT and a National Geographic Young Explorer who studies the history of Earth's changing climate. Uh, so she, her work has taken her from amazing places like the ancient lakes in the Andes in South America to the desert to the Western U.S. And she tries to understand how we know about climate that was in the distant, distant past. We all know how we can you know, understand weather from 10 years ago, but how do we understand from 5,000 or 10,000 years ago? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Christine, and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Jesse. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm tuning in from Boston, Massachusetts today, and I'm really excited to tell you all about the research I've been doing as a geologist and as a scientist. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now just to um, load my presentation and I'll be talking about uh, this for the next 20 minutes, but then I'm super excited to um, get any questions that you have for the 20 minutes after my presentation. Um, okay, so let's make this work. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Yep, you're perfect. Okay, awesome. Great, so uh, this is a picture of me um, in Australia, actually, in 2006. When I showed this picture to Jesse, he wanted me to, uh, he wanted me to tell, or he asked about these um, strange uh, eggs um, that I'm st uh, standing next to. Um, and they're actually emu eggs um, from emus that are indigenous to Australia, and they have this really amazing dark blue color. Um, I'm not going to be talking about emu eggs today, but um, this is my first encounter with something really strange um, in Australia. And so I just really like this photo because I was super excited about these. Okay, um, I'd love, love to talk to you about how I became a geologist. And I guess I'll start from when I was really small. This is me when I was one years old and um, I was born in uh, New Jersey. Um, and that's a picture of my dad. <laughs> right next to me. Um, as I grew up, um, I, I moved to upstate New York, and one thing that I really loved to do as I was growing up was to be outside. Um, I really like this picture of me, not only because I'm outside and I'm clearly really happy holding what I think is some kind of wheat willow uh, plant, um, but I also <laughs> was wearing a Pikachu jacket, um, which I still love Pikachu today, and I had no idea that I um, had this jacket when I was nine years old. Um, if anyone else is a fan of Pikachu, um, let me know in the uh, question and answer section. Um, so when I was young, uh, I really loved, I didn't actually, you know, a lot of scientists say like, oh, my favorite subject growing up in school was science. And I have to say that I'm not sure if that was necessarily me. I just knew that I really, really loved school. I loved art, I loved the music classes, I loved learning history and math. Um, I loved playing basketball in my physical education classes and soccer. And I generally just loved everything in school, but I couldn't tell you what my favorite subject was. Um, the very first time that I did something like a, a science project was actually about bees and I don't know why, but I was really, really scared of bees at this time. Um, and so I decided, oh, in order to get over my fears, I should study them more. And so that's why I did a project about bees and why I, I don't know if I did this on purpose, but um, I think I kind of dressed like a bee too um, during this presentation. Um, but this is all to say that I 
wasn't really sure growing up if I wanted to be a scientist necessarily. I just knew that I really liked to learn and I was really interested in learning new things about just about anything. I just really liked school. Um, another thing that I really enjoyed growing up was simply being outside. Um, I was lucky enough in upstate New York to, to grow next to some woods or there was a park nearby that I could always go to. And so I would definitely try to spend a lot of my time uh, being outdoors. Um, this picture on the right is of me actually helping with um, a riverbank cleanup to try to clean up the trash um, that's been left behind um, along the, this beautiful river that went past my high school. Um, and I just, because of where I grew up, I, I just developed the strong sense of wanting to preserve the environment around me so that other people could enjoy it as much as I did um, growing up. Um, and after high school, um, so, so in high school and all through school, all I knew was that I really loved to learn and I really liked going outside. And when I first went to college in New Jersey, um, my very first class in geology took us to, all the way to the state of California in the Death Valley region. Um, and it was there that I met an awesome group of friends, and it was also the first time that I saw epic mountains like the Sierra Nevadas in California um, with their snow-capped peaks. Growing up in upstate New York was mostly just hills. I don't know if folks in uh, Ontario or Texas, people, the folks turning in from tuning in from Nevada, you've probably seen mountains all your life, but for me, that was the, the most epic thing that I'd ever seen um, up until that point in, in, in my life. Um, other things that we did on this field trip were uh, uh, going on top of these amazing sand dunes in the middle of Death Valley. And I'd never seen these kinds of epic geologic formations before. And so I got really excited that um, potentially there was this way that I could merge my love of learning in general, uh, also, also with my love of simply being outdoors and being curious about the environment around me. And that's why I really first, this is the time that I've really first uh, started falling in love with the geology. Um, now, where I'm at now um, is actually in Massachusetts. Um, I go to the school of uh, Massachusetts, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And here I'm uh, a practicing scientist. I do research. Um, and I'm also trying to get this an advanced school degree, uh, my PhD or my doctorate um, in geology. Um, and so this continues me just loving uh, to learn and to explore um, and to really uh, learn more about the environment around me. And I feel so lucky every day that I am still basically in, I don't know what grade would that be if I'm, 20, let's see, 12, it's like 22nd grade almost pretty much is where I'm at now, if you were to continue um, from high school, that count from high school. And so um, the research that I'm doing, it's all about learning how Earth's water cycle um, changed in the past. Um, I'm sure lots of you folks, if you have watched the news, you hear stories about um, flooding events or extreme rainfall events that lead to flooding. Um, maybe the folks in Austin, Texas, I don't know if the flooding that occurred recently affected you, but um, these kinds of events, these flooding events, as well as these um, events where we're getting major droughts that are affecting um, our agricultural uh, systems and whatnot, um, and our, and our wa and water availability, um, these events are very important for us to study and learn from uh, so that we can better prepare for the future. Um, the, 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 work, the stuff that, so to, for learning more about droughts and um, flooding events, those are obviously all tied to how much rain is falling in the atmosphere onto the ground. And in the modern day, we use rain gauges, which are, and, and this picture looks pretty complicated or looks like it's a pretty complicated instrument, but really all it is is this cup, um, this clear cylinder that catches rain when it falls into the cylinder. And we measure how much rain falls by just simply reading um, off of the line of um, uh, this cup, uh, how much, you know, the amount, the number of inches or centimeters that fell 
in that cup. And that's pretty much how we've uh, measured rainfall for the last 200 years. It hasn't really changed very much other than uh, from this simple, you know, bowl in the air uh, device. Um, our oldest weather records actually come from, uh, or at least in, in North America, uh, actually come from really nearby to me in Milton, Massachusetts, this Blue Hill Observatory. It's home to the oldest climate record in the nation, and it started taking these kinds of weather measurements of temperature and amount of rain that was falling in 1885. But we don't have many records from before then, and we would really like to know um, what the climate and what weather was like um, hundreds of, if not thousands of years ago, before humans like us started really um, impacting and changing our environment the way that we have been over the past several hundred years. It'd be really great to have some kind of baseline uh, to see what the climate would have been like or was like without um, humans having such a massive impact on the climate like we are having today. And so this is my research question. How have precipitation patterns changed throughout all of Earth's history. Um, and so I first started researching this actually in the Western United States um, and the state of Nevada is right here in this um, picture. I don't know if, hopefully you can see my mouse. And it turns out, I'm, I'm sure the folks in Nevada know, it's a pretty dry place today. Um, but it turns out that several thousands of years ago, this entire region of the Western United States which again is a, is, a, is a very dry place, used to be filled with these enormous lakes. I'd like to point out this lake called Lake Bonneville. It was the largest of these lakes that used to exist in the Western United States. It was about the size of modern day Lake Michigan, um, one of the, the great lakes that exists um, uh, in North America. And, but today that lake no longer exists. And this is a picture of the Bonneville salt flats, the salt flats that, um, were deposited when all that uh, lake water went away. And so all that's left there is just salt, um, except for a little tiny pool called the Great Salt Lake, which is the only thing that remains of this massive lake that used to take up half of the state of Utah. Um, uh, these, the reason why we know that these lakes um, existed at some point in the past is because of these amazing features called paleo shorelines. This is a sketch from a geologist that was made in the early 1880s. And if you can see from this sketch, um, here's where the, the, mo the, the modern salt flat would be over towards the left of this image. And these stair step like terraces, those are benches that were carved by the lake water when it was at the elevation of those terraces. Um, so each of those flat points that you see or flat lines in this landscape, in the sketch, represents a time when the lake was at that elevation. Um, here's a photograph of just what, I'm, what that sketch showed, where you can follow these really flat lines across these mountainsides. And all of those lines, again, represent, um, represent a shoreline, an ancient shoreline from a lake that no longer exists today. And so I study those kinds of paleo shorelines, uh, mostly in the Western United States and the Central Andes. Here I'm in the Central Andes Mountains um, in South America. And you can see here, um, this is a picture of myself standing on one of these ancient shorelines or these ancient beaches. And this one kind of curves um, around to the back. And then there's also, I'd like to point your eye out to this other shoreline in the back here. Um, it's very faint, but that, also is another line that was shoreline that was carved into the landscape by these ancient lakes. Um, here's a satellite image of these paleo shorelines. Oops, sorry, it's a top, I, the presentation's moving ahead for me. Um, and you can see in the satellite image where those white arrows are, um, are places where when the lake was at a much higher elevation, um, it literally carved into the landscape and left behind these arcuate, arc-shaped bathtub-like rings in the landscape. And so you can see the imprints left behind by these lakes, um, even from space, even from satellite imagery, which is pretty epic. 
Now, if you were to actually walk along the landscape of one of these ancient lake basins, what you would see are these um, uh, really strange, oops, really strange uh, beige, whitish colored rocks. Um, and that's what's covering everything in the, in the foreground here. And it turns out that all of these beige colored rocks here, it's kind of coating the original rock, oops, the original rock face here, that's a dark brown slash purple basalt uh, of volcanic rock. And it turns out that this stuff is actually, these are fossils, fossils of ancient life, sorry, fossils of ancient life that um, used to exist when these lakes um, were around. Here you can kind of see these fan-shaped growths that kind of remind you of corals. You can think of these um, fossilized rocks, uh, which I call tufas. You can think of them as a lake's version of a coral reef. Um, and here you can see almost um, a, a inverse fan or cone-shaped um, feature um, in this beige, whitish colored rock here. And if you take an even closer look, you can actually see that some of these um, actually preserve the old um, uh, organisms that were involved in making these features. For example, here on the left is a picture of these tufas, the fossilized algae, and on the right are pictures of what that algae looks like today. And so we have fossils of these um, algae that were growing in the lakes when these ancient lakes were much larger and existed during this period of time. Um, oh, and sometimes these deposits also capture things like trees. So here in my hand on the left is a, it looks like a cast of basically wood um, that's made of calcium carbonate. Um, the, the rock, the, these tufa deposits um, are made of. And oh, and here's a video. So what I just described, um, here's a video of me driving up the Andes um, and now driving across one of the the now dry basins um, in, in that truck. And here is me and my field assistant Maya walking up um, the, the landscape uh, to one of these ancient lake basins. And oops, I don't know why I keep switching, sorry. Ooh. It's too excited to go to the next slide, that's the- Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, right, so driving, um, across the salt flat, hiking up to the to get to the ancient paleo shorelines, and eventually coming across you know these fossilized algae reefs and taking a sample of those and recording our observations um, in a notebook. And so our hope is to try to figure out when these ancient lakes existed. Um, because you can think of these ancient lake basins like uh, Earth's natural rain gauges, where any rainfall that falls within those basins um, is going to percolate or collect into the lake, and it's only going to leave through evaporation because none of these lakes are connected to the ocean. So if we can figure out when these ancient lakes existed and um, how big they were back in time, we can actually try to you know, you use a use a slew or a, a whole a map full of these ancient lake basins to try to figure out spatial patterns of where rain fell and where rain didn't fall, just by using all of these ancient lake basins like um, natural rain gauges that were embedded in the landscape. So my job is to figure out when those lakes existed by figuring out when the algae that made those tufa samples um, was last alive. And so that work has been um, really fulfilling and has brought me to some amazing places, like Jesse said earlier, the Western United States and the Central Andes. Here's just a few photos of what life is like when we're down there working um, in the field. Um, these are just some, some tents that we set up in the dry landscape. Um, this is our handy dandy red truck with all of our food and supplies in the back and two of my amazing fellow scientists. Um, I like this photo of the this um, Andean fox being really inquisitively looking at um, our truck and probably really interested in the food that we have in the back. Um, and oftentimes our handy dandy truck does get stuck because it's a really dry and sandy place and so I've had quite a few instances where I've had to dig the truck out um, to get it out of these sand pits. 
Um, and again, these landscapes are totally otherworldly. It feels like I'm on another planet and it makes sense when I hear about other researchers who um, you know, go to th this place to study um, or to, to, for example, test the Mars rover to figure out if the Mars rover is going to be able to um, make it in the crazy landscape that is Mars. Um, these landscapes are just really, really strange. As you can see, there's no vegetation anywhere. There's no plants or trees. It's just a, a, a barren landscape aside from those really awesome fossilized um, uh, remains of algae and other um, organisms. And so, yeah, these, I guess these are photos of just this incredible landscape and how strange it looks, right? There's, there's absolutely no trees. Here there are flamingos, though, in the foreground here, um, which is another thing that was crazy to me, that there are flamingos in the Central Andes. Um, oop, yeah, so um, just to finish up, so scientists like me, um, I'm not the only one who studies ancient lake basins. Um, there are hundreds of us around the world from many different institutions, um, and it's an international collaboration um, to uh, try to combine all of our work in all of these different lake basins to try to figure out uh, where rain was falling and where it wasn't. Um, here is a map of where every dot represents an ancient lake basin, and this is a map for um, of, of lakes today. Um, where yellow dots represent or indicate that the lake is very dry or the lake levels are really low. Dark blue represents um, or means that the lake is really high um, or, you know, very full. And the light blue means that the lake is kind of, you know, at a medium lake level. Okay, so this is a map of lakes in the present day. And you can already see, you know, in dry places like the western U.S. and Africa, um, Northern Africa, um, you know, these are places that we know are dry today, and so it makes sense that the lakes there are low today. However, if we combine our data from um, all the scientists who are working on ancient lakes, and we remake this map of what lake levels were doing um, 6,000 years ago, so sorry, that's what this means, 6,000 years before present, um, we get a different story where actually all of these lakes in um, Northern Africa suddenly turn on, you know, they're, they're, they're full, they're brimming. And um, this is one such phenomenon that we, um, in the community of scientists who study this, um, call the green Sahara, because we think that um, the Sahara in this area during this period of time was not, you know, a dry desert like we know it today, but was actually green environment full of vegetation and lakes and, and whatnot. Um, Oh, and this, and here, this is the same map, but now looking at lakes from 21,000 years ago before present. And now we're seeing all of these lakes in the Western United States that I was talking about before. Now those ones are, you know, active and large and, you know, representing an environment that's very different from what we're experiencing today. So this is an example of what we can do when scientists from all around the world collaborate with each other and make these kinds of maps. Um, Okay, so I think I've been talking long enough and I'd really love to hear some of your questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I also wanna say that this has been an amazing experience working, you know, of teamwork, of a bunch of different people coming together to try to figure out what Earth's water cycle was like back in the past. So um, that's it for my presentation. Outstanding, Christine. Take your time with getting on a screen share. Thank you so, so much. That was marvelous. Um, and yeah, we have our two other classes join us while you were like right at the beginning. So we're oh. going to welcome in uh, Miss Gales, Grade 7 from Starbud Lake, Ontario, and uh, Mount Royal Public School in Brampton. So you guys got everything working too, which is marvelous. So we'll start with a question from Miss Park's class. If you guys want to kick us off, uh, come on up. Any questions for Christine, guys? Miss Park's class, we can always come back. We'll come back to that class. We'll go to Mr. McCarthy's class for now. If you guys have a question to kick us off, grade 12s, go right ahead. Um, what is the most interesting thing you have found? Ooh, no pressure. Wow, great question. So many interesting things. Um, well, I guess something that I found in the Central Andes in South America, um, I stumbled upon this... Um, clay pot, essentially. Um, 
that was in the midst of you know all of the other white tufa rock and to me this clay pot was, was really symbolic to me or it indicated to me that this landscape which is you know one of the driest places on earth today um, used to be a place where people uh, could actually live and you know there and so there's uh, other researchers that have found you know lots of other evidence for early peoples in the central Andes and their communities and you know how they were able to live off of the landscape thousands of years ago um, and to me it was fascinating or just another um, way to to drive my research or, or make it meaningful um, because you know these landscapes are changing all the time clearly in the central andes which is a really harsh environment today where barely anybody um, where it's really hard really to, to, to survive it wasn't that way thousands of years ago um, and in fact there were lots of people you know making a living and um, thriving in this area and to me it spoke to how quickly our climate can change um, and and therefore by changing affect where places are habitable for human beings and where places are just a lot harder to 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 survive in um, and I just thought it was so cool to see, you know, I've, I talk about fingerprints left behind or evidence left behind by ancient climates, but finding this clay pot was evidence of, you know, past human beings who used to live in this area that would be really hard to live in today. So. Great answer. Uh, quick follow up on that. When you find something like that and it's not your area of research, do you reach out to anthropologists and get them, like, knowledge of where that clay pot is so that they can follow up? Sure, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a rule of thumb where if you do find something of anthropological significance, you know, something that was related to humans, once you find it, you want to make sure that you don't disturb it um, at all so that someone else who is an expert on that kind of research can then later come in and, um, and really study, you know, the, the remains or artifacts that are there as they were found. Um, so if anybody is, you know, walking, if you happen to walk around hiking in your backyard or at a park and you find something really cool, um, you might want to, you know, take home, for example, an arrowhead that you find. Um, and I certainly, when I was a kid, if I had found something super cool like that, I would have been like, oh man, this is going into my treasure chest or, or my collection. But actually, if we really want to better understand um, uh, um, these these past communities, um, you should really actually leave it in place and then contact um, the local museum or yeah, some local anthropologist so that they can come and um, analyze that artifact as it was um, where, you, where you found it, untouched. Wow. Yeah. Uh, all right, Ms. Nance's class, if you guys want to come up for a question. Yeah, you want to come over to the chair? Oh, okay. Hey, uh, do you think the green Sahara phenomenon is going to happen again? Oh, <laughs> good question. Well, and can you explain what the green Sahara phenomenon is, Christine? For those sure. who might not know. Yeah, yeah uh, maybe I can go back to. I'll, I'll quickly flip to my slide really quick, um, just so I can recap that. Play from current slide. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. It's this map of um, what lakes were doing 6,000 years ago. Um, and the question is about the Green Sahara and whether or not it's, it could happen again. Um, so here, um, you can see all of these lakes um, are high or medium high, whereas today, obviously, that region is a pretty dry, you know, it's the Sahara Desert, it's a pretty dry place. Um, and so the question of whether that would happen again. I guess under, if humans were not so dramatically affecting our climate today, um, there are patterns, natural patterns that um, Earth's climate will change um, over many thousands of years that it could happen again way far in the future, like many, many thousands of years in the future. Um, but at this point in time, you know, what's happening today with humans affecting the climate 
um, is unprecedented in all of Earth's history. And so it's, it's really unclear what's going to happen because we've had such a huge impact on, on the climate. And so I hope I'm answering your question. I guess if humans had not been affecting the climate as much as we have been, perhaps this, this would happen again many, many thousands of years uh, into the future. Um, Excellent. No, but as for what will happen, I don't know. I guess huh? we'll have to build a time machine. <laughs> That's our that's our physics lecture right after this. We've got one. We'll talk about that. Um, but no, great answer. Uh, all right, Mount Royal School guys, if you guys have a question, come on up. No, no, no. Oh, okay. no, we don't have it yet. No, we don't have, have, yet. No, no, we don't have yet. Right. We'll come back then. Uh, Miss Gail's class, you guys joined us after we began. If you guys have right, a you're up. Come on up. <laughs> ah! Hey. Hello. Uh, what do you think it was like before it became the Sahara Desert? Oh, before it became the Sahara Desert? Well, that's a that's a big question. Um, so, yeah, so Earth's climate has you know definitely changed in the past, and if we if we started you know way back you know four point six billion years ago. Um, before the continents actually had, you know, the the current position or orientation that they have now, um, it it would have been it would have been very different. Yeah. Um, for example, if th that region of Sahara Africa, um, if that continent was placed, you know, further north in in latitude, you know, surely it would be a lot colder. Um, you know, most of our environments on Earth are dictated by how far away they are from the equator of um, Earth. Um, most of, if you think about how much sun light reaches um, planet Earth, um, most of the radiation is hitting um, the equator. And so that's why um, in the tropical regions, we get lots of rainforests. Um, because there's so much heat and energy um, that allows for rain, a lot of rain to fall in those regions. But then immediately outside of that tropical band, we get these deserts. Um, and then if we move further, further north, sorry, my hands are like um, trying to represent different latitudes here. And if we move for, further north, like in North America, um, you'll notice that all of our weather patterns move from um, west all the way to the east, right? Like we know, like in Boston, I know what the weather's like because there's there's a weather station, you know, to, west of me. Um, and, and so all of those storms that we see um, move from west to east. And that kind of circulation pattern um, uh, is very particular to that part of um, this band of latitude. And then, then what happens in you know the poles, obviously it's very cold because not as much sunlight is able to reach that area today. So I guess to cycle back to the question of what the Sahara, the Sahara Desert would have been like before there was a desert, I guess it depends if we're thinking about things on many millions of years it would depend on where Africa was relative to um, its position in latitude. Um, thinking more recently, um, you know, some folks think that it might have, you know, fluctuated between, you know, being wet and being dry, being wet and being dry um, over many tens of thousands of years. Um, and, you know, maybe you noticed from the map that we don't have as many records you know, the map was kind of full today, and then 6,000 years ago, it wasn't, it was less full, and then 21,000 years ago, there weren't, there was even fewer dots on the map. As we go further and further back in the past, we have fewer um, surviving records to look at, and so it gets harder to know what happened further back in the past, because time erodes everything. 
It's a tricky thing as a geologist to you know know what time scale to talk about. All the time scales, whether it's fifty thousand years or you know two billion years, are impossible to understand as a human in a human lifetime. Uh, but there's some really great YouTube videos for classes that you can watch the continents shift over time so throughout the history of the Earth, how the continents have changed, and so basically every area on Earth has been every kind of habitat over the time since the dawn of the Earth. They've been Arctic, they've been deserts, they've been mountains, they've been grasslands, they've been <laughs> everything, which is uh, really really neat. Uh, so I'm glad we got that question. That's marvelous. And let's uh, cycle back through. So Miss Park's class, do you guys have a first question for us now? Some point you gonna go up? None of us have any questions. Nope, that's okay, guys. All right, we'll go to uh, back to Mr. McCarthy's class. Um, what's What's the question that you hope to answer in your lifetime when your work is due? The question that I hope to answer in my lifetime. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Well, lately I've been thinking a lot about, um, so for first I'll start with um, my thesis. I've been thinking a lot about um, obviously where rain has fallen and how pa rainfall patterns have shifted throughout time. But more and more lately, um, and, and that's all related to you know past climate change. Um, more and more, I've been thinking about how I can apply my knowledge of the past as a geologist to help us um, actually solve, from an engineering perspective, um, the problems that we're facing today. Um, we are pumping a lot of CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, and because of this, you know, Earth is getting warmer and um, all of our models agree that it's going to get warmer and warmer everywhere and I've been wondering you know the the rocks that I've been talking about um, they're made of calcium carbonate which uh, is a source of you know uh, carbon that's not in the atmosphere but now is a rock um, and I've been thinking a lot about ways to remove CO2 from our atmosphere and store it back into rocks so that maybe we have more of a chance to try to reduce the, the habits that um, we have made in which we're consuming a lot of material and therefore um, expelling a lot of CO2 from, from industry, from all of our activities, you know, driving cars, flying planes, you know, all of that. And so the, the questions, I don't know if it's a question, that I would love to solve, but if I'm, I'm dreaming big, I would love to figure out how to speed up the process of um, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, they call this carbon capture, um, uh, carbon capture technologies. And lots of people are working on this, um, but I'm thinking about it more from the perspective of a geologist that you know looks at rocks that have carbon in them. And, and now I'm wondering, how do I actually make those rocks? So there's a for you and for the classes, there's a really great book that's actually been brought up in numerous of our April hangouts called Drawdown, which is all about climate change yeah. solutions. And one of the things that they really want to focus on is is increased weathering. How do we get more carbon into rocks? This is the best way to remove it from the cycle for millions of years. So Drawdown for the classes. If you guys want to look up an outstanding book on the topic, check that out. Um, great answer. All right, we'll go back to Ms. Hans's class. A couple more questions here, guys. Come on up. Kevin. Yeah, take your time, don't worry. Uh, um, in all the places you've traveled to to study, which one has been your favorite? Oh, wow. Which one has been my favorite? That's a tricky one. Uh, I think I, I, the places have all been amazing, but what has really made my experiences um, unforgettable has really been uh, the people that I happen to go into the field with. Um, and for, for maybe that reason, um, I'll say that I really love working in the Western United States. It's where I first, you know, my first geology class went to California and I actually, I didn't show pictures of this, but I did visit some of those ancient lakes from that very first geology trip I ever took. And it's almost kind of poetic that I get to then go back and study them as a, as a proper scientist now. Um, so I think I would say the, 
Western United States, around California or, or Utah, those systems really have a, 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 a soft spot in my heart just because I've been thinking about them so long. Um, and uh, the, the folks that I happen to work with there are really amazing. Not that the folks from the Central Andes are, are bad or anything, no, don't mean to imply that. Um, but it's really just the amount of time that I've started think I've been thinking about those lakes in the Western US makes me, if I had to pick a favorite, I, I would choose that. Um, but the Central Andes is also amazing simply because it's another far, it's a hard, it's harder to get to. And so maybe one could say that fewer people have had the experience of being able to go there. And so for that reason, I feel so lucky to have been able to be a person who, who can get to experience these crazy landscapes that people think might be good analogs for other planets. Um, yeah, all of it is amazing is all, all I, that's what I could say, but West, the Western United States has a soft spot in my heart, yeah. Probably. Um, all right, uh, Mount Royal guys, if you guys have a question now, come on up. What do you think will happen to the drinking water to in five to ten years? Ooh. Well, I can say that in places where other scientists um, have predicted that there will be more drought or less rainfall, um, the drinking water is probably still going to be probably still going to be there in five to ten years um, in, in North America, I suppose. Um, but perhaps the folks who manage the water utility systems, um, the hard work working folks there, might start um, asking questions about uh, whether there needs to be um, times when we need to ration our water, for example, or you know certain hours where water can't be used. I think the drinking water itself, you know, it'll all still be, you know, healthy to drink, but maybe the amount of water, um, it could change in some places um, in five to 10 years. Um, but, but the water quality itself should be fine, but perhaps the amount of water or where, where, it's, uh, where, where it needs it most in really dry regions, it seems like those are gonna continue to get drier. Um, and so if you live in a place that is particularly dry, like the, the class in Nevada. Um, uh, maybe you can start thinking about ways to be more, con you know, conservative with your water use. You know, like simply washing your hands um, and making sure that the tap isn't running when you're doing that. Could, you know, if everyone does their share, we could, you know, make sure that these resources keep continuing to be renewable. Perfect, and, and I'm glad we have a Nevada class actually for that sort of message. And, and Las Vegas is one of the best places in, in the world actually now in terms of water rationing and the, the policies they have in place to do that. So excellent job. Um, all right, we'll finish off with one question from Miss Gail's class. Who is the question, Spencer? Um, have you ever found something that you thought was a good find but ended up being insignificant? Ah, great question. Ooh, something that I, so the question was, if I've ever found something that I thought was cool, um, but then ended up being insignificant. Ah, uh, good question. Um, to be honest, even, so I guess I don't know, it, insignificant is, is, a, is a hard word. I think, so I'll, I'll tell a story. I. There was one um, lake system that I was really excited about, and it had, I think I actually showed a video, that video of me like hammering um, into the rock to, to collect a sample of tufa. Um, I was really excited about those samples because um, they looked like they preserved the um, algae really well. Um, and I thought that, oh, it should be pretty easy to figure out how old you know, the sample is. Um, but then I brought it all the way back to the lab at, here at MIT, and it turns out that it w actually wasn't so easy anymore, and that those samples, even though they looked really amazing in the field, were actually not going to be as helpful for me to actually figure out when those lakes last existed. And I wouldn't say that, that because it didn't work out, 
how I wanted to or how, how I'd hoped that it was an insignificant thing. Um, it, you know, science is, is, a, is a game of, you know, luck sometimes. You know, you're going to fail a lot, and that's okay. We learn something from, from things not uh, meeting our expectations. And so now I know to tell anybody else who's working in this lake basin to don't try to figure out how old those samples are because it's really, really hard. And that negative result um, is still scientifically interesting. Though perhaps not as exciting, it's still um, in new information that is still significant um, for science. Outstanding. We're so glad we got to that. We don't usually get to that sort of uh, statement in, in front of these presentations, but that's really nice. Uh, so, Christine, thank you so, so much for joining us today. What we do at the end of every Hangout, so I'm going to demute every mic's, uh, classroom's microphone. So, Ms. Park, Ms. Ms. Rambersad, Ms. Gale, if you guys could get your students to join me in saying a huge thank you for joining us today. I'll demute it. Thank you. Thanks to all our classes for joining us. We hope you join us for the rest of April. Christine, that was marvelous. It's so nice to have a geologist. We so seldom get you guys, so thanks so much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse, for hosting.